Good evening, and welcome to the Gerald Ford Energy Lecture Series. This is the first lecture in what we hope to be a very long series. I'm Bruce Goodman from the law firm of Barnum, Ritter, and Schmidt and Howlett. I'm one of the co-sponsors of this event. It's good to see so many familiar faces out there in the audience. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to briefly explain how this lecture series evolved. I want to give credit to Dr. Nick Panzo, Nick here today. You know, one day Nick came into my office, and Nick, if you don't know, is a very av avid solar energy advocate. And if you know Nick, you know that. He came into my office and explained that in his opinion, President Gerald Ford was instrumental in getting the federal government involved in developing alternative energy technology and the research and development effort that was required to develop solar, wind, biomass, and biofuel. It was Nick's idea that Grand Rapids would be the ideal place to host energy lectures featuring nationally known speakers. Well, after Nick talked to me, I took the idea to the Barnum man management team, and they were very enthusiastic about the idea. And then I went to Joe Calvaruso, the Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation. He liked the idea. And here we are tonight, and you will soon be meeting Frank Zarb, our first speaker. For those of you that like to plan ahead, our second speaker is already lined up, thanks to Nick. It's going to be Charlie Maxwell, a native Michiganian who's going to be here on November 10th at 7.30 to so get out your blackberries, put it in. I can see you all back here. He's going to talk about what will oil prices be in the year 2015? <laughs> for tonight's schedule, Mr. Zarr will speak for 20 or 30 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer period. I think you all picked up cards on the way in. As questions occur to you, write them down, pass them to the aisles, collect them. And then Mr. Zarr and I are going to sit over here and answer those questions. I think we'll have you out of here by 9 o'clock. I think we have a very exciting program. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephen Ford, son of President Ford, who will introduce tonight's speaker. First, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, for sponsoring this. And what a fascinating series. We just had a great dinner over at the Amway and we're sitting next to Mr. Zar and Frank and you're, you're in for a treat here. You really are in for a treat. So, But Bruce, thank you so much. Your firm sponsoring this series and, and we're very, very excited about it. I, I see some of my uh, trust, I'm chairman of the board for a while. Three years, I guess. And, and, uh, my mother would be killing me right now if she knew I was up here without a suit on. Uh, <laughs> United Airlines has my suit right now, so uh, I'm stuck with my problem, so I apologize. But uh, I see we've got some of our trustees here, John Babb, my uncle Dick, uh, Bob Booker, Marty Allen. Uh, I want to thank you guys for being here. We have a wonderful board of trustees. Uh, Elaine Didier, who's the executive director of the museum and library. And our executive director of the Ford Foundation, Joe Calaruso, and his wife. Uh, so, uh, fine staff, a lot of good people, and we're going to have a great night tonight. I, my pleasure to introduce Frank. Um, you know, we're, we're going to talk about energy and things like that, and you didn't come to hear me talk. But I, I can tell you, this is a, a, a good, good, good family friend. A good friend of both my mother and my father. He was a great public servant, but he was a good friend of my parents. And Frank Zarb uh, currently serves as senior advisor to Elman and Friedman, uh, non-executive chairman of the Promontory Financial Group, as well as executive in residence at Columbia University. 
Mr. Zarb served as director on over 12 different corporate boards. Some of the positions that he held that you might be familiar with some of these companies in the past was chairman and CEO of NASDAQ Stock Market Inc., vice chairman and group chief executive of the Travelers Inc., chairman and chief executive officer of Smith Barney. His former government service in this page would go on and on. I've kind of condensed it for you. He was executive director of the Cabinet Level Energy Resources Council, administrator of the Federal Energy Administration, assistant to the President for Energy Affairs, that would be the Energy Czar, during the first oil embargo, associate director of the Office of Management and Budget, assistant secretary of labor. He served in various assignments with the Nixon, Ford, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administration. I can, I can tell you one thing, I, I, every time I come back to this museum, I am reminded of the image of what our family walked into um, in 1974 when we stood on the lawn there and Nixon's helicopter was taken off and Dad was walking in to be sworn in as president. And there were no celebrations, there were no galas, there were no balls, it was, uh, it was a very troubled time in crisis in America and that's the time that uh, Mr. Zarb is going to talk about. Uh, Twelve months before Dad took office, the price of oil was three to four dollars on the open market. In the next twelve months, it went up over three to four hundred percent to twelve dollars a barrel. Stock market crash and the war in Vietnam, the Cold War with the Russians, inflation was about fourteen and a half percent, unemployment eight or nine percent, and we had an energy crisis. I'm very grateful that uh, when Dad was vice president, that there were several men that possibly foresaw the future and knew that my dad might become president someday. And from time to time, would sit down with dad as vice president and keep him up to date in case he had to step in and take the reins of this country. Henry Kissinger did it on international affairs. Uh, there were two men that did it on the domestic affairs, Paul O'Neill and Mr. Frank Zara. And I can tell you as a son, I'm very grateful he was one of the guys that was doing it. Now, there's one story, and I want him to clear it up once he gets up here. And he, he talked about it at dinner. I, I'd always heard this story. I didn't know if it was true, and I'll let him finish it for you. There was a story that my dad was getting ready to do an on-air, live uh, press conference from the library in the White House. And uh, it was right before the State of the Union, that Mr. Zarr corrected me, it was at a different time. But apparently, Frank walked into the room, and he, he looked over, and my dad's getting ready to go on camera for you know, 10, 15 minute talk to the American people. And he looked over, and my dad was fiddling with his, his shirt, his cuffs, and he'd forgotten to bring his cufflinks down. And he didn't have any cufflinks. And Frank, I'm going to bring you up here, and I'm going to let you finish that story. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, it's, uh, so it, it reminds me of a story that both President Ford and I heard from a member of Congress who was a friend of both of us. He told a story about the guy who was about ready to be hung. He committed a crime, he was a prisoner, and he was going to be hung. He went out to the gallows, and there was TV and everybody standing there. It was a very important event. And uh, the uh, hangman said to the poor fellow, do you have the last comments? And the guy said, no, I have nothing to say. And he said, no, wait a minute, no, we've got TV here, you've got to say something. And he said, I have nothing to say. There was a congressman in the audience, and the congressman got to his feet and said, will the congressman, will, will the gentleman yield? <laughs> and he said, sure, but hang me first. <laughs> start this talk this evening with this question, and I'm going to end it with the same question. Will our political leaders ever be able to take short-term pain for the long-term good of the nation? And that's a broad question. It applies to a number of public policy needs. But tonight, to make my point, I want to focus on one energy. In 1973, the Arab members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Country Companies, country, OPEC, affected an oil embargo on the United States. As a direct result, in a few weeks, our GDP dropped an estimated $15 billion, unemployment increased by 500,000 workers, hospitals ran out of fuel oil, and the federal government actually took control of our ability to buy gasoline and heat our homes. In 1973, we imported 35% of our oil needs. We currently import over 60% of our oil needs. More than $400 billion a year leaves the United States every year to buy oil from foreign sources, most of it from the Middle East. The impact of a major oil disruption, from our economy to our national security, is unthinkable. But ladies and gentlemen, it could happen. So, you ask, how could it be that since 1973 we have done so little to re retard our expanding exposure to oil imports from questionable parts of the world? Well, for a brief moment, 1974, 1975, a frightened nation seemed willing to look at major initiatives to drive down our dependence on foreign oil. The political landscape was unique. President Ford was an unelected leader, stood fond responding to questions about the pardon of Richard Nixon. The House of Representatives was dominated by a liberal freshman class swept into office on the fumes of Watergate. Long lines at service stations, hospitals running out of heating oil, factories shutting down. All that sparked a momentary broad support to do something about our energy situation. The embargo ended in 1974. But the country was dealing with inflation, recession, unemployment, some delicate labor issues, and we were still reeling from the impacts of Watergate. Nevertheless, President Ford made energy a very high priority. He told us to structure a plan which would begin the long-term process toward reducing imports from the Middle East. It took us about four months in 1974 to create a comprehensive legislative package. The president met with us regularly, mostly at Camp David. He went through every single detail as we built the plan. He instructed his cabinet secretaries to be involved and supportive. And he said it in a way that everybody got his clear message. This initiative is important to me and not subject to the normal interdepartmental squabble. 
Believe me, they got that message. The work was done, the final product was comprehensive and sharply focused. Some of the cabinet officers, especially those on the political side of the House, grumbled that it gave too much ammunition to the opposition in the Congress. I was relatively young and I was, I was learning every day I was there. It amused me that the grumbling was kind of steady, but always just out of earshot of the president. <laughs> the Ford Plan was first introduced in January 1975 by way of the State of the Union message. Using 30% of his time on energy, the president told the joint session, joint session of the Congress that he would submit legislation which, if enacted, would, one, force conservation through fuel taxes and the elimination of price controls, which go back to 1969. It would greatly expand the number of nuclear plants from in the next 10 to 15 years. Three, it would add substantial new coal production and additional power plants fueled by coal. Four, it would open the outer continental shelf and other areas for oil and gas exploration. Five, it supported the construction of new oil refineries. Six, it would begin to build a sensible and realistic development of synthetic fuels. Seven, it mandated construction of a strategic oil reserve to house millions and millions of gallons for, for emergency. All this was tough stuff. The plan called for fuel cost offsets for low-income low Americans. They paid special attention to the environmental issues that were involved. They paid special attention to the nuclear safety issues that were involved. All the bases were covered, and I thought covered pretty well. The Congress and some of their special interest groups were caught by surprise, and they couldn't react very quickly. To me, it was a wonderful moment. <laughs> <laughs> Here was this man from Michigan, drafted to be president, up for re-election in less than two years, this former congressman, who had better political antenna than anybody I knew, was proposing to increase the energy cost to voters. He was going to significantly expand controversial nuclear energy. He was going to drill for oil in the so-called protected areas. He was a politician who talked about doing what was right for the country, even if it might not be in the best interest of his election campaign. When Congress finally woke up from their stupor, the opposition attempted to attack the plan. It was not very easy at the outset. The nation was still bleeding from the embargo, so it's hard to argue that we shouldn't do anything about future energy, future uh, oil disruptions. And the only way to do that, to, to defend against that, would be to significantly retard consumption, higher prices, and greatly expand production of domestic energy. And ladies and gentlemen, there were no other answers on the table. For the most part, the opposition was very shallow. In opposing the Ford plan, Jimmy Carter, who was getting ready to run against the president, proposed that we order all service stations to close on Sunday. He also said that the government should take charge of allocating all fuels. He complained that the president's proposals would be inflationary. Yes, the president's plan would have increased the price of fuel. Gasoline would have gone from 53 cents a gallon to 70 cents a gallon, but it would have started early a trend which would have had significant long-term benefits. The silliness was bipartisan. A senior Republican senator urged that we should solve the problem entirely with synthetic fuels. I knew this guy, he was a, a, a very nice man, long-term senator. But he had no idea what synthetic fuels were, none. <laughs> he had no idea their state of development or how fast they could compete in the marketplace. That was the answer. 
The Democrats in Congress came up with some alternative ideas which were completely anti, because there were no other ideas. They were ridiculed even by the media, the, the, the liberal media. I say those pieces, that were, that were the most important to me. A cartoon in the Washington Post which depicted the silliness of the, the Democrats counterproposal. I love that cartoon. Actually, it's here now in the museum. So, in the early days, I believe that we had a real chance of getting something seriously enacted. Now, working against this was the increasing flow of oil from the Mideast and the dropping of oil prices. The crisis was dissipated. A recession meant lower consumption, and a club, a very sly OPEC, talked about lower prices in the future. Just exactly what the American voter wanted to hear. As 1975 wore on, the Congress held hearings on parts of the President's plan. The price of oil did not rise, there was ample supply, and of course, they were just coming on to the 1976 elections, which had a very major impact on what was going to happen next. All those forces resulted in a steady reduction of what was initially a small reservoir of congressional courage. I went to see Scoop Jackson, who was my Senate Oversight Chairman. Scoop was a senator from the state of Washington, a Democrat, but a real supporter, a real learner. I complained that we were losing traction and what the Congress intended to do would be inadequate. In response, he asked me, do you know how to make a new embargo? He turned out to be right. Without a crisis, this Congress was not going to do what needed to be done. The battle continued for the rest of 1975 and got intense at times. Strange alliances were formed as a member of trade unions sided with us. Consumer groups led by Ralph Nader opposed our efforts to raise prices and surprisingly he was backed by the environmental community. When I asked a lead environmentalist, how can you oppose a measure which would lower the use of fossil fuels. <clears throat> he said, NATO helps us, we have to help him. That was one of the many lessons I learned that year about how Washington worked and maybe didn't work. The president, on the other hand, never lost his enthusiasm to get the plan enacted. At one point he told me, we have to keep fighting for every element, but that in the end, we're gonna get less than we want. He added that after the election, we would go back to Congress and pound the way for the rest of the package. I truly believe, as I stand here and you can see, that had he been elected, we would have gotten that energy or most of it enacted, and this would be a different country. Of course, the president was right. In the end, the Congress gave us the easy stuff. They authorized the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. They gave us a program for mandating fuel efficiency standards of automobiles. They approved appliance energy, energy labeling. So when you buy an appliance, it tells you how efficient it is. That came out of that. It was a very easy thing for the Congress to do. But they punted on all the important things. All the price they control. All the things that they thought would not be handy during an election. And you know how the election turned out. Jimmy Carter talked to talk. He created a government-owned synthetic fuels corporation for alternative sources of energy. It was owned by the government. It was scandal-ridden, did little to advance technology, wasted and lost millions and millions of dollars, and ultimately was shut down by Ronald Reagan. But Ronald Reagan Bush, Bush Sr., Clinton, and the second Bush did nothing significant to stop the steady expansion of our employed oil. None of them made the national energy their priority. Just a fact. Like, like these guys, as I did most of them, didn't even work for most of them. It's a fact. They refused to make energy a national priority. Don't you wonder how the world would be different today if the Ford Energy Plan had been adopted 36 years ago? 
Here's some thoughts. First, we have control over our own energy universe. Second, energy prices would probably be low, probably be lower, going to benefit going to our economy. Third, we'd be further along in developing competitive alternative sources of energy. Fourth, it's important, our foreign policy and defense strategy would not be distorted by our dependency on Middle East oil. I can make a pretty good case that had we achieved the energy self-sufficiency that the Ford plan envisioned, we would not be in Iraq today. In mid-1975, I told President Ford that our proposed plan was making both Republicans and Democrats unhappy. He thought about that for a few minutes. I don't forget that moment. He said, that means we have it exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Before I end this evening, I asked you to think about today's economic turmoil in the context of the energy crisis almost 40 years ago. Ultimately, there's only one way to reset the massive debt strangling our economy, and that's to reduce spending big time and raise revenue. It will not be accomplished with, with populist rhetoric. Solving our current fiscal challenges with a good old-fashioned forward leadership and courage. At the beginning of this talk, I asked a question. Will our political leaders ever be able to take short-term pain for the long-term good of the nation? I'm presumptuous enough to consider how Jerry Ford would answer that question. I think he would say, only if the voters have what it takes to elect and hold politicians accountable for the real value they bring to the long-term long good to the United States of America, even if their actions subtract from their political careers. So as we head into 2012 elections, why not ask every candidate, what bold decisions have you made that subtracted from your own personal ambitions but benefited the greater good? And further, ask each one of them, can you measure up to the standard set by one of the greatest presidents in our history, Gerald R. Ford? Thank you. So I said, I'm going to answer your question 
Well, with respect to your observation, I'll pass. You know, a lady got up in the back of the room and said, you're going to miss a lot of fun. <laughs> Of course not. That's too damn simplistic. 
But the fact is there needs to be increased revenues and there needs to be very serious cuts in our spending. If you don't think in those terms, we're not going to get from here to there. Can you talk about the conundrum of government support for currently non-competitive energy sources versus the status quo? I, I gather you're talking about the subsidies for things like solar and wind? Uh, I think it's more uh, subsidies for oil and coal. Uh, questioner. Who, 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 who asked the question? Who asked the question? I did this. Ethanol, solar, wind, all that. All the yeah, I think, uh, uh, look, it's a mixed bag. It's either good or bad. I think ethanol is, is, has gotten carried into the pork department. And we get strong agricultural uh, senators and congressmen, and they trade off for somebody else's dam. Uh, you know, I talked to, talk to you about learning experience in government. I never had any political experience. I got to government by accident, and I, I stayed in government because the president put his arm around me one day and said, I have one more thing for you to do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, it, uh, it, when I was at OMB, George Schultz was Secretary of Treasury, and he said we have to stop adding new starts to public works every year. Because the game is you get them added, and then you fund them $10 the first year, and by the third year you got 500000 going into them. So it was the favorite public works. Department. And since that was part of my, my part of the budget, I was to go to the Congress and convince them to suspend new starts for three years. Now, honest to God, I didn't realize that, that this was currency. You know, you give me your votes and I'll give you your dam. And this was big business in the Congress. But when I went down to see a congressman by the name of Jones. I believe he came from Alabama. He was 80-something years old. He was chairman of the House Subcommittee on Public Works. And OMB staff was really good, and they prepared me completely. My, my presentation was bulletproof. Why? It made good sense. Just three years stopped through starts. So we didn't catch up. We had something like a 70-year backlog. And he was very, he was a southern gentleman, big drawl, uh, very pleasant. He interrupted me once. He went to his drawer and took out a Chug of bourbon, ten o'clock in the morning. Pour himself one, pour me one. He went this way, and I went this way. <laughs> well, I finished my presentation, which I thought I did a really good job. There was this pause that felt much longer than it really was. And he looked at me, and I want to forget these words. He said, "Boy, you fussing with the testicles of the universe." <laughs> <laughs> Solar, look, 
The reality is that sun and wind and all other alternatives represent about 6% of our total industry use. And we've been at it now for more than 30 years. So we've got at least another 30 years before we can begin to make a measurable amount. So as much as I love it, who could argue with that nice, clean, good stuff, uh, we have to be realists. The, uh, your talk, talk uh, you spoke about synthetic fuels, and I, I'm not sure that everybody in the audience would exactly uh, realize that that probably wasn't uh, ethanol, but it was coal-based and it. gasification of... And, and I add solar and wind to it. It's a, uh, synthetic, synthetic fuels, is, if, you, if you believe in oil, gas, and coal, are, are real fuels. Nuclear power is 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 it, it was then a real opportunity. We can still build them with reasonable capital. Uh, we hadn't yet got the, the plaintiff's bar up to the point where they made it an industry to sue new nuclear power plants. We had some 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 real setbacks, and this latest event in Japan, I'm afraid, is going to set us back once again. Technology is there. You can build a nuclear power plant that, that we could be assured would stand the kind of forces that they had in Japan. To try and explain that to people who watch those images on TV, pretty doggone tough. But ultimately, the, the French have done it. The French did it when we didn't do it, and now most of their electricity comes from nuclear power in France. But it's a it's a tough subject to sell. You said that um, the Ford legislation was looking for 10 to 15 nuclear plants. No, no, no. I said additional ones in 10 to 15 years. He had a number. And if you guys go home and go online, take down the 1975 State of the Union message that was in there, how many in there. And the way he got to that was he, calcul he calculated how many barrels of oil he wanted to decrease from our import base over what period of time. I don't remember the numbers and they'd be too boring anyway. But we added, once we said we wanted to be, within 15 years, importing this much less oil, then we had to find the characteristics of each, each supply, such as nuclear coal, additional oil fines, that would bring us down to that. And it was relatively rough, but that's the way it was pretty scientific from that standpoint. Ch changing gears for a minute over to the auto industry. Uh, I know you and I talked at dinner about uh, your experience with electric cars early on, and, and you might know that West Michigan is pretty excited about the prospect of electric vehicles with some battery plants uh, starting up in, in this area. Talk about your, your experience with electric cars and, and whether that was really on the horizon. Look, I think we're finally getting there. But 36 years ago, uh, as, a, as a photo op, I believe it was General Motors, brought one to Washington, and, and I got in it to take its first time, and it had to be one of the first prototypes, and we got to a hill that wouldn't go up the hill. <laughs> uh, but it's taken us 35 years to get to the point where I truly believe we're beginning to see uh, the, the commercialization of the electric vehicle for some very good reasons. And, and from here on out, it's going to get better and better and better. It just takes time for these technologies to develop. So, uh, if you're asking me, I think there's a future for the electric car, I think. Because they thought that's 1900, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that I noted, uh, as Nick and, and I talked about, President Ford, was that uh, he started some research and development that ultimately led to the National Re Renewable Energy Lab out in Golden, Colorado. What was the idea, and, and it sounds like perhaps that wasn't a major part of his package because you were looking at oil, but no, you it, focused on that idea. What was it? It was, it was part of a thought out, a completely thought out plan that said while well, we have to do all these things which will, will give us a fix over the next 20 to 30 years, we have to be thinking beyond that, so we constructed the Energy Research and Development Administration. And their mission was to think through the questions that were intelligently raised here a short while ago. What role can the government play to help technologies come onto the marketplace? And quickly, you can't pick winners and losers. What you can do is help 
for competitors to get out there and compete. That takes a lot of smarts, a lot of technology, a lot of reaching out to the private sector, a lot of private sector experience, and less political interference. Uh, that was the idea, and it was truly a part of the entire mechanism. You know, in, in the media, we talk, we're talking a lot about scientists and, and whether they're to be trusted and whether they can see into the future at all. Um, in the Ford administration, what role did scientists play in terms of informing the legislative approach? Or is it just pure politics? Well, it's a mixed bag. Uh, you had some who were clearly uh, thoughtful, independent-minded, cared about their integrity, and would give you an opinion. Uh, you had others who were, uh, I would say, biased. So if you wanted to find your scientist, you could always find your scientist to tell your story. Uh, it's like every other community of people. It's like, like economists. You know, my favorite would be boys, but you know, these guys can tell you this month, here's what's going to happen in the next three years. And next month, come back and say, here's what's going to happen in the next three years. And it's nothing like what he said a few months ago. He doesn't even have to explain himself. It just happens to be an economic, economic way of things. But scientific is a place in this whole area of planning for good, sound scientific thinking. And the best way to harness it is to find the private sector scientists to, to, to participate rather than the politically attached scientists. Do I say that elegantly enough? Yes. Yes. <laughs> here's, an, here's an individual that uh, starts by saying, uh, P.S. Ford's 70, 1975 State of the Union speech inspired me to become an energy professional, electrical engineer. So, so uh, uh, an, an informed question, do you support the Open Fuels Standard Act? I'm not sure I know what that means. I'm not sure I agree with it. Yeah. Who's asked the question? Over here. What does it do? Uh, it, it prescribes that uh, all cars sold in America be flex fuel. All cars in America do what? Be flex fuel. Be, be flex, flex fuel. Be hybrid. Any combination of gasoline, ethanol, and methanol. Well, that sounds like a political bill. I mean, I don't know what the science is to back that up, or the economics to back it up. But if there's a scientific, economic argument to be made, we should hear it. Back in the 70s, it was not technically possible, but with electronic fuel injection, it's very easy. Right. Well, it's that, you see, we can't even bring this to the table if you don't have a government who's not willing to make this an issue. If, if people ask me all the time, what do you think should happen? And it's, it's a hard answer, except if we had a President Ford in the White House, he was the kind of person who could take the leadership on both sides and say, we're going to take two major public policy issues and we're going to put it out of political balance. The Republicans will agree that they will not politicize, they will not compete with your candidate on these two issues at the next election, and you'll do the same thing. He had the trust and the ability to pull that off. We need leadership that gets that done. Without it, we don't even get those issues on the table, and they don't, don't get a chance to come through the bureaucracy. Uh, somebody who was sparked by your support of nuclear energy, I think. Uh, can nuclear waste be stored safely? Maybe the better question is Nevada the place to put somebody who doesn't have to I'm not going to get into geography. Uh, uh, look, the mistake we made was not because we stopped building nuclear power plants. And when I left government, more nuclear, far more nuclear waste came from the military than from the private sector. We certainly didn't stop the military. So that argument in my book, that, that time it was classified uh, isn't anymore, but that time uh, it meant it held the whole war. Now, having said that, if we had a plan to expand our nuclear fleet, we would have to have a significant investment in finding answers to those questions as the storage. 
Yes, it can be stored now temporarily. Can it be stored long term with this technology or should it be? No. Can we find that the science that would get us there? Yes. But if we start, if we put a stop to nuclear power plants, we're going to put a stop to everything else that follows. So someone pointed out to me that we've had these uh, nuclear power plants going around the world underwater and as aircraft carriers for years and years and years with no reported incidents. So they can be operated safely and on a small scale. But you really have to demand the level of protection you want. And that's what was envisioned in this plan. Uh, technology can be built for user engineers here, you know better than that. Technology is there to build a nuclear power plant that will take the kinds of stresses that we saw in Japan. And, uh, and so you can do it. The trouble is we got to a point where the capital obligation is going to be very difficult to compete. This question may be a little too political, but uh, you know, Secretary Chu, Secretary of Energy, was appointed um, on the basis of being a scientist himself. In fact, I've heard that he's anxious to be out of that job because it's too political and rather be doing the science. So do you have an opinion about the job that he is doing? All reports is he's a good person. And his, and his scientific record is, I think, quite good. Uh, he can only do what the leadership of his government lays out for him to do. He can't. He, he certainly can't take this issue independently and run with it. So I feel his pain. <laughs> I'm lucky enough to have a president who not only allowed this to happen, but was at the point. And with all the flack I took, the long gasoline lines, and, and all the, I, I had protected detail for a while. So we caught a Washington Post reporter tried to look into my garage to see if I owned a gas guzzling car because I was campaigning against gas guzzling car. Like a writer president, no matter where I was in the world, I knew my back was covered. You need that kind of leadership to get things done in the world. People that know me will recognize this as my question. Uh, when the president and his staff were working on alternative energy ideas, what role did investor-owned utilities play in terms of advising, opposing, supporting, or were they not a player at that time? Mixed bag. Uh, you had some enlightened ones who participated, who ran demonstration projects, who would do things. Uh, those that thought it was a whole bunch of nonsense, you know, the conventional fuels was the uh, only thing that's going to work, and they gave, gave a lip service, and they pushed them into a corner. Uh, it, look, the president and I went to Colorado. There was a government demonstration project going on for a number of years in the oil shale. And uh, we, came, we were, came from Beaver Creek. We've been there for a couple of weeks. Uh, we took that presidential helicopter and went to Colorado with a site. And we got off and walked to this thing in the middle of the, of the sand. And there's this vat filled with oil. And this contraption that was churning out oil. And very impressive. And one of the guys there who was on staff worked for me at OMB. And as I walked around, we shook hands and he and I walked around. He whispered in my ear that that bat took three and a half months to fill. So there was a lot of shenanigans going on. And, you know, Armin Hammer, who ran Occidental, used to come to Washington and, and the president would call me and say, Armin Hammer just asked to see me. What's he want? And what he wanted was more public lands for his shale project. Uh, and every year, Ten dollars more of oil and shale will be profitable. When it got to be twenty dollars, thirty dollars would be thirty dollars, forty dollars. So you have to sort through it. That's where good science helped with some of the practical people who understand the who understood the economics of energy and didn't have a separate action around. Not easy to find all those characteristics in a single person. Is uh, 
Is mass transit part of the answer? How can we have a national agenda to upgrade mass transit from coast to coast to support more impactful energy positions for America? But mass transit is obviously an answer for many parts of the country. Uh, it is a great place to think in terms of pay by use. So short of helping people who can't afford it, which should be done, it should pay for itself. It needs capital help at the front, and government loans certainly play a role, but you've got to determine where you do that. Uh, I was telling some of our folks here at dinner that uh, when we looked at uh, some of the remedies during the embargo, we came up with a 55 mile hour speed limit. And uh, that had a lot of characteristics we were looking for. It would save fuel, it would save the environment, uh, it would uh, uh, cut down on accidents, which is a black matter. But it also would let the American people participate with us in trying to get this problem solved. It was kind of a soft characteristic. It wasn't dominant, but it was present. So we thought we felt pretty good about announcing 55 miles speed limit. We took some heat from the parts of the country that can't afford mass transit. The governor of Montana didn't like the idea. And there was pushback. We finally got it enacted because it was really <clears throat> too hard to fight against. Afterwards, the governor of Montana, who was right here in his own views, and is representing his own state, he said, you guys, you guys in the East Coast can get on the subway and go to where you're going. And, and so one way of answering your question that we should make that happen, make it available. He said, in my state, you have to drive 100 miles to go to work. And when we got it enacted, he called me back good natured. He said, we just passed a law that in Montana, when you get caught speeding, it's a $5 fine. But then you're paid up for the next 12 months. Where mass transit will really pay back and and make sure that our our, our focus is in that category. One size doesn't fit all, does it? Never did. Um, got two or three more questions here. If there are any more out there, you better pass them in. Um, somebody observing that the automotive uh, uh, industry over 25 years produces smaller cars and nobody buys them unless fuel prices go up. Um, is there any way to encourage people to drive more efficient cars? Yeah, that's a valid observation. I think, however, you're looking at the change of balance, that the buyer now is leaning more toward fuel efficiency, even though they might not buy the Mini, but they're looking at that sticker, and they're looking at, at hybrids, and they're seriously considering electric cars. My son is a wire in Washington, D.C., and he's looking at an electric car. So it, it's beginning to move in that direction. Uh, I'll show you a story that is just, it's part of the American landscape, so but it's not being critical of uh, Meeting in the Oval Office, 1975, first half. Henry Ford, uh, Lee Iacocca was his assistant, holding his towel, as I recall, standing behind him. Skyler <laughs> Smith, who ran General Motors, I didn't know very well. And a guy who ran Chrysler with an Italian name. It didn't matter. The president wanted their support in decontrolling the price of gasoline, which we finally did. We got products decontrolled. It was the crew of our group. But these guys were respectful. They listened to the president. Uh, no one ever really spoke their mind to all spoke their mind outside in the waiting room. When they got into the Oval Office, it was yes or no, sir. You're absolutely right, sir. 
So we walked out, and I was part of a conversation with these guys. And it was clear to me, they didn't say this, it was clear to me that they thought that the president's notion that prices need to go up and will go up, and we should be thinking about a more efficient fleet, was senile. And then the Japanese proceeded to clean our clock. <laughs> so we've got to begin, begin to make honest appraisals of where we're going. You think oil prices are going to go down with the Japanese and the Indians now in the market capturing a lot of the available oil supply? I don't think so. So you have to make some rough calculations, and I think the pendulum is swinging in that direction. We've left natural gas off the agenda. Um, in your opinion, can natural gas solve the energy crisis? And before I before I lead you astray here, the, the follow-up question is, what's your opinion of fracking in terms of increasing the, the natural gas? That's, natural gas is an important component and shall be a more important component going forward. It's clean, it's plentiful, and it'll be more plentiful. Uh, I'm always surprised that it didn't make more head roads in the automobile sector. I always thought it was going to be a competition between the electric car and the gas car because in many ways the early stuff that I saw showed that there was a real race there to be had. Uh, I guess it was the distribution of fuel factor. It's easy to plug in the walls, not so easy to find a gas station that has natural gas. But I think natural gas is going to continue to play a more important an important role. It won't solve the crisis. It won't solve the problem. For a lot of reasons I won't go into right now, but believe me. Uh, fracking, I think, needs, needs still to be proven to some, and I'm not, I don't have the science enough to know, but I believe it looks like it can be done safely. I don't think it should be done in Grand Rapids in the middle of the city, some of the public. Uh, let me grab that. some cities. But there are plenty of parts of the country where fracking could work. Uh, I would urge a go slow and a bulletproof case made that it can be done without rupturing the water supply someplace. And that, who knows they don't know what fracture is? You, you, you have to go through the water table to get to the gas. That's oversimplistic. But uh, it's to some people a scary thought, to the people who do it and know it, say it's a real answer. I think it's worth, worth pursuing. And the last question uh, uh, takes us full circle, perhaps. How can we turn public opinion toward favoring a sound energy policy besides having another oil era, uh, an era of oil embargo? What will motivate the American public or, as you said numerous times tonight, leader of politicians to, to, to stand up and, and do something? You know, I, I've been asked that question so many times over the years, and I've thought it, thought it, thought it. Uh, I've come full circle, and I've now become a fan of, of fixed terms. Pick it, six years, eight years, for every federal official, you get one term in your outfall. who first of all realize that someday they're going to have to earn a living, and many of them have already earned a living, so that's a good thing. But you're not there thinking about this decision will hurt me in my next election. Now, well, how we get there when you have a, a Congress full of career politicians, uh, you have to tell me. The other way is the way I described earlier. A president for the White House who has the respect and integrity, uh, and I'll end by telling a story about that, who could get both parties to agree to put out of bounds two or three major public policy areas, where it can't be politically attacked by either side. The world knows it, so any hot dog who tries to take advantage of it would get shut down immediately. Uh, but uh, I sat in the Oval Office Carl Albert, Speaker of the House, Mike Mansfield, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, both 
Democrats that are both Democrats, President Ford, an additional energy policy, it wasn't part of the long term policy. We talked it through, shook hands, the meeting was over. The world never even knew that meeting took place. One more story before I quit. The administration, Henry Kissinger came back after meeting with the Shah of Iran and said, the Shah wants to sell us oil at a discount to OPEC. Henry oftentimes came back from visits with this kind of thing. <laughs> the president who knew uh, warned me, but he said we have to run it down. So for a year, I negotiated with a guy by the name of Hushang Ansari, who was the Iranian oil minister. And uh, he liked nice hotels in London, Paris, and south of France, and he liked women. So I thought these negotiations were going to go on forever because he gave him an opportunity to do what he liked. <laughs> <laughs> All this time, I was trying to push this price down because when you buy oil from another country, we have a law that says you have to use American ships. That pushes the cost up. So Henry Kissinger's discount turned out to be a 25% premium per barrel. So uh, the negotiations were hard. I kept trying to get that price down. At one point I said to the President, you know, what we're doing, we don't even know if it's legal. Can the government buy this oil and redistribute it to the private sector? There are lots of questions. And if this gets leaked to the Congress, it's gonna, we're going to have some grief. So he thought about it and said, go talk to Scoop Jackson and John Dingle. Dingle was my oversight chairman of the House. Scoop of my book section in the Senate. And tell him I sent you. I went to see Scoop. I told him what we were doing. He said, it makes sense to me. You were with my blessing. I went to see Dingle, who had gone from my arch enemy, and he beat me up regularly publicly because I was raising the price of gasoline, and Detroit didn't like that. To becoming my friend and supporter, even sometimes secretly. He said to me, I told him the president asked me to. He said, go do it. And if anybody in this house asks for one question, you tell them to come see me. So I went out and I had the full air cover. And I got it because of the president of the United States who had the trust of these guys. We need to get back to that. If we have a hope to really run this country the way a country should be run. Thank you very much.
Uh, we'll also have these books available for sale here at the museum after that. Um, we have a Ben Franklin exhibit that just opened in September and will run through January 8th. This is not the night to see it, but we hope you'll come back and take a look at that. It's a wonderful exhibit. And of course, we're stock block uh, as part of our prize, and this is, this is just a wonderful time for us. Coming up, we have another member of the Ford administration who will be speaking on October 12th. That's Ron Nesson, who was the press secretary, has a new book out called Making the News, Taking the News. So that will be here on the 12th. And looking ahead, this is our 30th anniversary year for both the library and the museum. And we're having Andrea Mitchell speaking in October over at the library, and the Honorable James Baker on Sunday afternoon, October 30th, here at the museum. So there's lots going on. We have program flyers for you out in the lobby, so pick one up as you go. And we thank you so much for coming, and thank Barnum again for honoring us by having this program here this evening.